coming up next on Keys to Kingdom Living. I want to talk to you today about never forget the cross and the crown. Never forget it. In the day that we're living in, we need to remember the cross, what Christ has done, and the crown, what Christ is going to give us. Now, uh, look there in Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse uh, 7. It says in Revelation 3, 7, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he, Christ, who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens up and, one, and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. I see, uh, see I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. That feels like us sometimes, don't it? We have just a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my commandments and to, per to persevere. Because you have kept my command to persevere. That's powerful, isn't it? We've got to keep his command so that we can persevere. I, will, I also will uh, keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am... I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Now, the, he, these are not the last days he's talking about. These are the last moments. We're living in the last of the last of the last of the days, and we know that because of Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is more than eschatology. It's the time clock that lets us know the day and the hour that we're living in. And he says, Behold. I am coming quickly, and the closer we get to his coming, the harder the battle is going to be because Satan is going to fight us so that we will try to give up on what we have believed in for generations. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. Now, if he warns us to uh, beware of this, then that means that somebody can seduce us. They can, they can uh, manipulate us. They can mislead us. They can lead us astray. So we got to be careful who we look at. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Father, we thank you for this word you've given me. It's a word in season to those who are weary, both here and those who are watching. We pray your anointing of God destroy every work of the enemy in this house today. For your, your glory and your honor, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The cross of Christ is where our victory was won. Let me say that again. The cross of Christ was where our victory was won and sealed forever. The crown that God will give to all who endure faithfully to the end is our reward for what? Our reward for holding on to our faith in the cross. So the cross is behind us, but the crown is before us. you got to have a, a, a point of origin and a place of destination. you got to know where you came from, and you got to know where you're going. I am in Christ. And in Christ, my beginning started at the cross. And it will end with Christ when he hands me that crown of life. Now, if we were to lose sight of the cross, we will run the risk of forfeiting our crown or our reward. Get this in your heart. We're in a battle for your literal soul. In your patience, possess you your soul. There's a lot of people right now giving up on their faith. So if we lose sight of the cross, what Christ has done for us, we run the risk of forfeiting our crown or our reward. We must keep the faith. One of the biggest weapons out of Satan's arsenal that I see him working on Christians right now is he's getting them temporal-minded. 
and causing them to think temporally and for the moment. And when people take their eyes off the eternal God, off of the eternal word, and they set their sight on building their little kingdom here and now and putting down roots in this earth, they are losing sight of the eternal consequences of their mistakes now. And when you lose sight of an eternal uh, uh, perspective, then it can cause you to become overwhelmed when the enemy comes up against you. you got to know in your life that there is somebody greater than you inside of you that will give you the victory to pull you up out of what the enemy is trying to drown you in. Now, occasionally, we get lifted up. Things going real good, feel real good, everything's all right, and we get, to get lax on God. But God says, I am with you. But sometimes we can forget that he is with us. It's not that we say, all right, I don't know where God went. But it's that we don't rely on him as much. And when we get to where we don't rely on him as much, he sees that as dangerous to our soul. He wants you to know that he is always with us. Now look there in Revelation 12. Somebody's going to have to help me preach this morning. Revelation 12, 7. Since the dawn of creation, since God created man, blew in breath into their lungs, there has been a war. And it says in verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Do you see that? They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, uh, called uh, the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice. See, this is simultaneously. While he is being cast out of heaven, he says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. We've got to overcome our accuser. I'll talk about that in a little while. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but we're in a war. It is a spiritual war. I can tell you one thing that is certainly for certain, and it's this. If you're blood-bought, if you're born again, if you're a child of God who stands on the Word of God, you have been in a battle. Not only for yourself and your soul, but for your children and your grandchildren. You have been in a battle, whether you realize it or not, whether you're, you're privy to the information that, that gives you the understanding of what uh, spiritual warfare is about, you're still in it. Yeah. Christians that haven't been taught about spiritual warfare just sense that there's a pressure in and on their life, and when they go out into the world, it only intensifies. They go to psychologists and, se and therapists because they're not taught by their pastors what spiritual warfare is about, and they think they have a disorder or a condition, and all it is is a devil. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and so the enemy comes and he fights us, and he likes to fight people that are blind. Have you felt recently an intensity of warfare and pressure in your own life? Now, before I go any further, let me assure you of this one thing. In Christ, we have already obtained the victory. It's done. If you're in Christ, you have already overcome death, hell, and the grave. Satan may be able to persecute us. He may be able to pressure us on every side, but we are not forsaken in any of it. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But let me exhort you here for a moment. Knowing that you have the victory... And feeling like you're fighting for your dear life on a consistent basis can cause you to grow weary while well-doing. On one hand, you know you've got the victory in Christ, right? On the other hand, you're still living in this God-forsaken world. 
And you think, I know I have the victory. And over here, I'm fighting a battle that's absolutely killing me. It's a dichotomy. It just, it's like one day you get up and you can take on the world. The next day, you don't even want to uncover your head. Right? People look at you and say you're bipolar. I am a bipolar holy roller. If there's any balance about me, it's because I'm connected to Christ. I didn't coin that phrase. That came from Carmen. But you feel that way sometimes, don't you? It seems to me that the closer we get to overcoming Satan and the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, the harder the hits come against us. Now look there in Hebrews 10. 10 1031. You know, we're going to have that battle until Jesus comes and gets us or we go to see him. That's a given. We're in this world, we're not of it, and we're going to have a battle. But the attacks that come against you personally, you don't have to put up with that junk. you got to be wise as a serpent, yet stay as harmless as a dove and say, God, this thing is trying to destroy me, it's trying to take me out, it's trying to destroy my family, but I know that you have not sent this, this has not come from you, this has come from the pit of hell. I know I have a battle, but this one is getting to be so intense, I am losing my faith, God. That's an attack of Satan, you don't have to put up with it. He's trying to take advantage of you. He finds our weaknesses, and he exploits them. Look there in uh, verse 31, are you in Hebrews 10? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, a living, of the living God, the living God. But recall the former days in which you, after you were illuminated, you endured a great stu uh, struggle with sufferings. Do you see that? When, when you become illu illuminated, you know, Paul talked about that in Ephesians 1. He says, after you came to faith or put trust in Christ, your mind was illuminated by the spirit of revelation, wisdom, and understanding in the knowledge of the truth. You became illuminated to the invisible world where God exists. Right? But, but once you got the illumination and your spirit was, was birthed by the spirit of God and you became a new creation in Christ, you started enduring and having great struggle, which came with great conflict and suffering. And it seemed, have you ever noticed this? The more we, uh, we get a greater understanding of Christ and a revelation of Christ, it seems the harder the, the war becomes. The more we are illuminated by Christ, the stronger we become in the Lord, the stronger the battle becomes. It's not an accident, it's in the Word of God. That's to keep you focused so you keep your eyes on Jesus and on the reward and off of the conflict. You can get so caught up in your wars and your conflicts that you lose sight that you've got the victory in this. I am more than a conqueror. I'm not just going to conquer this. I'm already more than a conqueror through Christ. I've got to find the key to this. Debbie was attacked in her sleep. Now, now she used to have asthma. And, and uh, asthma takes your breath. If you ever had it, you can't breathe. And she woke up and she was gasping. <gasps> She couldn't get her breath. And she said, Lord, what was that? He said, an enemy was trying to take your airways because you're singing that revive me. Let the breath of God revive me. And the enemy came and attacked me. What I want to know, God, is why did you allow it? You know what it was. You know why he did it. And you tell Debbie why it was. But why didn't you stop it? Because he says, I've given you your will. I've given you my keys to the kingdom. And when you find out what devil it is, you can put that devil to flight. Then you can walk in the, the pulmonary ward of the hospital, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I've given you authority. This ain't child's play. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you get through something, or am, I, am I okay here? He 
people say, I can't believe they get loud at church. <laughs> get up and shout. Somebody can step across the goal line and they go eight. That victory is, tar- yeah, is temporal. Yeah. They, they throw a pig skin on the ground and say, hallelujah. That's, that's temporal. Yeah. But whenever you overcome the wiles of the devil, yeah. that's eternal. Yeah. Satan does not want you glorifying God for your victories. He wants you to shut up, sit down, and act religious devil's a liar so when you go through these battles it's not about you You, now Satan will make you think it's about you because you're the one in the battle but the battle's not about you it's about your faith and when you come through this battle and you will because he's going to do it again when you come through this Simon strengthen your brethren you know, I didn't realize why I went through all that hell last year, but now I understand. I'm going to use what I went through to, to explain to some other people, you can overcome this. This ain't nothing but an attack of the enemy. Right? And it encourages their faith. Satan don't want you to encourage other people's faith. One can chase... You connect your faith with somebody else that's struggling in their faith, it's over. They're going to win the victory. Let's get through this scripture. Verse 33. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches, you ever been there, and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated, for you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven Therefore, do not cast away your... There it is right there. Satan is after your confidence. I, have a, I know in whom I have believed. I have a confidence, and every time I get up and shout about that confidence, Satan says, I'm going to try that confidence. And God says, but I'm reminding you, in your confidence is your victory. And if you'll hold on to your confidence, Confident and do not cast that away, you will have great recompense of reward. There is coming a reward, and for those that were so treated and, and, and beat and pulverized and just, just beat up like meat, God's going to greatly reward you. You had not suffered one thing for Christ, that God will not give it back to you in this life and in the life to come. It's going to be payback time. So read on. You had, you had compassion on me when I was in prison. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. That's where we're at, people. We need endurance. This warfare that all Christians are engaged in will either cause you to grow in your faith or make you become weak and want to walk away from your faith. That's how intense this warfare. It's drawing a line in the sand. I believe that happened in Joshua's day, didn't it? He came up on the Lord of hosts. He says, are you on my side or are you on their side? And he says, back up, Jack. I'm the Lord of hosts. You better get on my side. Right? The day of living for the moment is over. As a believer in Christ, we must set our eyes on the reward that awaits those who keep the faith and endure the temptations of this world with faithfulness. Anyone who looks at or lives for the pleasures of the moment won't possess the fortitude to endure the hardness of battle that we are facing. If you're living for the moment and, and only for what this life can offer you, you will not have or possess the fortitude, the grit, the tenacity in order to endure the hardness of this battle that we're facing. It's time for Christians to get serious about their faith in Christ and their relationship with Jesus. you got to choose this day. We're living in the evil days, and we've got to have a foundation in which to build our faith and our lives upon. 
You can't just believe something. Oh, I believe. I believe there's no hell. Really? Let's see how that works in a few years. What's that ba- what, do you, what do you base that on? My belief. Go build you a house without a foundation. Let's see how that works for you. <laughs> Belief is, is nothing without it being put in something. Right. You've got to put faith in someone or something. We've got to have a foundation in which to put or base our faith on so that Satan can't uproot us from our confidence in Christ and in the Word of God. He's trying to uproot us, if you hadn't noticed that or not. Look there in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Going about as a roaring lion, God says about Satan, seeking whom he may devour, but the Bible says resist him. You can't resist him if you don't know what to resist him with. I bind you in the name of Jesus that Paul used to preach about. That'll work real well. They'll know you're ignorant, and they will come after you even harder. We got us a good in here, God. I mean, Satan. We're going to eat their ignorant lunch. It ain't going to work. What does it say here in verse 10? Are you with me? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the world. That's not what it says to Christians. It says be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against, against, against what? The wiles, the methodology, the strategies of the devil. For we do not wrestle. There that word is again. We're in a war. We're wrestling against, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. When these people come up against you, they're not coming up against you because of your cuteness. It's a spirit. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in where? They ain't even on the earth. Do you see this? But they use people on the earth to get you focused on this temporal thing so you will forget the eternal vision you get tunnel vision you get blindsided wickedness in heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what withstand don't say engage it says withstand resist him in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore on air no having your your waist uh, uh, girded about with truth putting on the breastplate of righteousness having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith which with uh, with which you will be able to do what quench put out bring to to naught all the fiery fiery darts of the wicked one Take on the helmet of salvation and with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer, supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You got to be equipped, right? You got to be prepared. You got to have an understanding. You are in a spiritual battle. If you don't, then you will fall or succumb to the strict tricks of the devil and start fighting this thing in the natural, and he will whoop you every time. Instead of walking in victory, you'll walk in defeat. Right? So it's time for the body of Christ to set our face like flint. That's hard. And fasten our eyes on our great reward that lays ahead of us. As we stand on the word of God and keep our hearts and mind on the reward of being welcomed and honored for a job well done by the king of kings, this will encourage us to keep the faith and not give in to the lies and the threats of Satan. You've got to know who you are in Christ. You can't listen to people. They'll mess with you. Because you'll listen to one person, they'll tell you one thing, and, and in 10 minutes later, somebody will tell you the exact opposite. And you thought I was m- messed up. You cannot get your identity from what people think or believe. You've got to know the Christ that's inside of you if you're going to stand. Paul used the term wrestle. So while we know that our souls are secure in Christ, we also know that we must endure faithfully 
to Christ until the end. Now, isn't that weird? We have the victory in Christ, but then we got to stand against the wiles of the devil until Christ comes and, re and brings us back to him. Huh. What's up with that? Paul tells us there in Ephesians 6 exactly what or who we are fighting. The more the church grows in the word and in their faith in Christ, the more threatening the rulers of this age become. They get threatened when we grow up. Because when we get, get in our spiritual authority and we know who we are in Christ, then we become unshakable. What did she say about broken focus? Broken focus will get you killed. It will. It'll like to call Simon his faith. Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift you, have you like, so he can sift you like wheat. But I am praying for your faith that it fails you not. Broken focus almost cost him his apostleship. I'm telling you, by the Spirit of God this morning, the enemy is trying to get you out of your authority in Christ. He's launching attacks against your mind, against your everything. He's trying to destroy your faith in Christ to get you out of your spiritual authority. But when you know who you are in Christ, you'll blow off Sambalad, Tobiah, Geshem. You'll say, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. I'm sorry you don't like the way I do things, but I'm not preaching to you apparently. How can two walk together except they be in agreement? Now, as we're growing up, now if you endure and you don't cast off restraint, you don't defect from your faith, you don't apostate, but you stay and you keep your hands to the plow, then you are advancing the kingdom of God and you will grow. You will grow. Anybody that stays abiding in the vine, they're going to grow and they're going to produce fruit. And the more the church grows, it may not look much nothing, like much in the, the natural. Neither did those slaves coming out of Egypt. But, buddy, by the time they got to the Red Sea and God got a hold of, of their ears, it was over for Pharaoh. They didn't have no army. They had a bunch of former slaves standing down there trembling in their boots. And Pharaoh comes out with his choice chariots, his great men of valor, to take over these slaves, but he met up with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So as we come to our, into our age, the age that Galatians 4 talks about, the master, though he be master, he is yet servant and put under guardians and tutors until the appointed time of the Father. And then when he comes into that place where he walks in his authority, it's over. That's where we're, we're coming to. Now, in the world, it don't look like we're coming together. But God's working on us as individuals. And when he gets through with us as individuals, he will pull us together corporately. I have 7,000 that have not bowed their knees to Baal. I got been working on them as individuals, but at any moment I could pull them together. And you, you, you ain't, the world has not seen anything until they see God assemble his saints. Listen, listen. If we're nothing but a bunch of has beens and wash ups and wannabes, and, and, and our word that we preach is really there's nothing to it, then let me ask you this question. Why does Satan spend billions of dollars out of his kingdom and tax little Christians that come together in the group of agreement under the banner of God's righteousness and attacks them if we're really nothing to us? Don't let the enemy deceive you. Christ is in you. Let God arise. When God arises, his enemies are going to be scattered. Satan knows that. He knows he has a short time. He hates people that are on fire for God. 
He attacks them. You can preach one of the best messages you ever preached on Sunday, and Monday morning he'll have emails, he'll have phone calls attacking you. Who do you think you are? I'm just obeying God. Well, I don't know that God you obey. Well, you better get to know him or you're going to find out what Satan looks like. We're in a war, spiritual battle. This was exemplified. See, Satan don't want you growing up. He don't want you to stay connected to, the, to Christ. He don't want you to get the understanding through a teacher, a preacher, a pastor, evangelist, an apostle, a prophet. He don't want you to get that understanding that you have a great reward. So he fights you. He tries to get you distracted. If temptation and lust won't work, he'll fight you. He'll attack your family. He'll attack your health. Is anybody relating to me up here? He'll come after you. Why is it that Satan cares about what you come in contact with? He knows once you come in contact with Christ and then you. No, it's not just get connected with him. I joined the church today. It's about knowing him. When you come to know him, it's over. This was exemplified in the story of Elijah. You remember him? Up on Mount Carmel, he had revival with 850 prophets of Baal. Elijah had great victory over every one of those, destroyed them. You know what they were doing, prophets of Baal? They were leading Israel into idolatry and pagan worship of false gods. God wasn't pleased with this. Why was, why was Israel being seduced by Satan? Because they were God's chosen people. And he says, if I can seduce them, I can't win victory over them if, they're, if they know who they are in Christ. But if I can seduce them to where they forget their God, I can do anything I want to to them, and they don't have anything to say against me. That's what he's doing to the church in America. Seducing us with everything that is out there. Hitting us with everything in his arsenal. Trying to discourage us and get us to give over and, and go after false gods. The dollar. So they were worshiping false gods. But the ruler behind this cultish worship knew that her authority over Israel was now threatened. See, Elijah had a heyday up there on Mount Carmel. Can you imagine being one prophet of God and taking out 850 men by yourself? The anointing is all over you, brother. You're untouchable. And the next day, somebody got loose and went and wagged their tongue to Jezebel. A woman in authority, but not given to her, taken. She was given authority by the Jews of Israel because they rebelled against God and gave place to a seductive spirit. And when Elijah said, I've had enough of this, God give me their head, he said, take them, boy. I mean, he had one more great day in the spirit when he destroyed all of them. But somebody got back to Jezebel and said, that prophet's after you. She's not in his, his geographical area. She sends message to him, principality power there. I alone have escaped, and I've come to tell you, Job, all your children are dead. Principality of power is air. An evil report. Because whenever you're in this, this kind of intense warfare, there's a lot at stake. When we were over in the trailer and nobody knew anything about what was going on in this church, we didn't have much to worry about. But when we start saying we're going global and, and God's voice is going to be heard through the nation, to the nations of the world through this ministry, Satan says, there's something going on there. You hang out over here and watch, it, watch what's going on, you prince over there, North Georgia. You hang and watch out. They start taking out prophets of Baal, you let me know. I'll send one of my imps take out the head. If we ain't all that, and we ain't important, then why has Satan got a, a crosshair on my head? Why has he got one on your head? Huh? 
If we ain't all that, if, we, if God ain't doing something through us that is going to turn the world upside down, why is Satan fighting us? Huh? David was hated, and he was just a ruddy little boy. Nobody liked him. He was ran out. He said, you stay out there. Stay with them nasty sheep. If he wasn't all that, and he was just a pitiful little boy, then why didn't the enemy like him? Because they saw the potential on him. And it wasn't David. It was the Spirit of Christ on him. Because David was going to occupy the throne of Christ and get it warm for him. Now watch. She heard this. She got wind of it. Your kingdom's coming down, Jezebel. So she sent word to Elijah. Satan knows he has but a short time, and he's hitting the body of Christ with every vile, every wicked, every perverse spirit in the world trying to wear us down. It's time for the church to stand up and sound the battle cry. We are not defeated. We may be cast down. We may be persecuted, but we are not destroyed. We may be hard-pressed on every side, but the Lord is for us. Somebody needs to shout a battle cry. We are not defeated. I refuse to bow a knee to the spirit that tries to come against us and destroy us. God is greater than that demon. Now here's the hard part. You okay? Here's the hard part. We know God can whip hell. He's already done it. We don't know if God will whip hell through us. See, it goes back to our confidence. Can God pull me through this cancer? Can God pull me through this divorce? Can God pull me through this hardship? Can God pull me through this bankruptcy? You got to have confidence. I am not a product of my circumstances. I am a fruit of God's spirit. Though the weapon is formed, it's not going to turn me against God. We got to sound the battle cry. Greater is he that is in us. Look there in Psalm 24. I'm going to tell you what that battle cry is. I am. She's laughing because they've been in prayer for three days, prayer and fasting and intercessors. They had to pray this thing through. See, see, it ain't just the word somebody preaching. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that a lot of y'all don't even know about. There's people praying, they're laying their life down and, and pushing their plate away so you can get the word. Well, I just thought I was coming to Sunday service. No, it's hell up in here. Satan is after you. You're valuable. Now, he'll come and tell you, you can sell yourself out to a prostitute and tell you you're worthless. But God says if he's doing that to you, it's because you're valuable. I've marked you. Satan's trying to buy you out. And that's going on right now. If you go to Hebrews, I think it's 13th chapter, it talks about, and do not be like Esau, who was a fornicator. A pro profane person. That word porn fornicator comes from the, the word in the Greek that we get pornography. That, that word literally means to prostitute or to be bought out like a prostitute. And the enemy is doing that to a lot of people in the body of Christ. He's finding their pressure point and at a price he can buy them out and sell their, their, their faith. We're not to be like Esau and sell out our birthright for a morsel of bread. The birthright is eternal. The morsel of bread is gone. Look there in Psalm 24. We're almost done. And we'll let you go back to your battle. It's always funner whenever you let us do it, right? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's putting it right down there in front, isn't he? This is where the Lord is. It all belongs to him, the world and those who dwell therein. And he has founded it upon the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend unto the holy hill of God? Only those uh, are stand on his holy place. Uh, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, 
who has not lifted up his soul uh, to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Well, I just don't know if that pastor's really got the, the integrity that his mouth says he does. It's right there. You're not going to send the holy hill of God with deceit in your mouth. You're not going to send a, a sin go up in the holy hill of God if you've lifted your soul up to an idol or sworn deceitfully. I'm after some kind of demon. I can feel it all up in here, but that sucker is dead. He shall receive blessing from the Lord. He shall. This is you. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who what? Seek him who seek your face. Now lift up your heads, O you gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift you up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. The king of glory. That's his name. Don't be cast down. Lift up your head. The enemy is trying to tell you it's over. He convinced Elijah. And where did his head go? Between his legs. He said it's over. Can you imagine that? See, when, when, you're, when you're in that place, in heavenly places, fighting with the sword of the Spirit, and Satan's able to land one against you, you wake up sitting on the ground with your head between your legs saying it's over, God. It isn't us. I'm there. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd have thrown up my hands and said it's over. But God. Now, when I get to the place that I am nothing but God, then the king of glory is going to rise up. When you get to that place that there is nothing left of you but God, it's over. And when it's over, it's over. No, you ain't hearing me. When God says it's over, it's over. When God says it's enough, it's enough. Because when Pharaoh says, oh, I've got one more left in me, he says, bring it on because this time you're not coming up against my people. You won't lay one hand on my people from this day forward. And evermore, your, 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 your whip won't even come close to my people because now I have arisen over my people and my fire is going to keep you from them. By God! By God! See, the enemy thought he was going to destroy you with those drugs and those illicit affairs. By God! God says, I want that person and I'm going to get that person. And when I get them, it's going to be over. This stuff going to come out of their mouths. It's going to astound the greatest scholars ever went through university. They'll say, my God, I've never heard anything like that. But God. They won't get glorified or lifted up or exalted because they know it's but God. So let me end with this. As long as we don't backslide into unbelief and sin, we're advancing the kingdom of God and holding the banner of righteousness up high. If you want to walk in, vic in the victory that Christ has already won on our behalf, then you will have to keep your focus and your faith by standing on God's word and his promises. If you want to walk in victory and overcome that demon that's trying to keep you out of your place, then you've got to stand on the word. and You can't stand on what you don't know. Watch this. God gave this to me this week. He said, I want you to look what Satan did in the Bible. He would go to. He went to Eve. Go look for her. He went to Jesus. And Job, he went to God. What's he doing? He's seeking anybody that is ignorant spiritually of their position in Christ so he can eat them alive. He went to Eve and he found a gullible woman who did not know her identity wanted to use sin to become like God he went to Jesus tested him but he found out Jesus didn't use hold on a second Satan 
Let me look in the newspaper and see what's going on today. He says, it is written. That's all. He didn't go into tongues and call that devil everything in the book. He used the word. He put his faith in the word. What did Satan do? He tucked his tail and he left. But watch. It's not just about having faith. But our faith must be rooted and grounded in God's word. Now that is our victory over the devil. So when Satan came to them, watch this. He didn't come to them after they had done great things. In both cases, he came to them before they had done great things. How many here has had promises from God that you're going to do great things? Raise your hand. And they hadn't happened yet. Guess what? Satan is toying with you. He's tempting you. He's seducing you. And he's hitting you in your mind, your body, and your soul. Trying to get you to stop walking by faith. He came to them pre-ministry, if you will, and tempted them. Because he says, I want to buy you out and buy your anointing. Are you listening, preachers? He's tempting you because God has put promises in your heart that you're going to do great things for the kingdom of God. And then Satan, right after that, comes to you and tempts you because he knows you're going to have great potential against his kingdoms. So he's going to try to find out what price he can buy you. And he came to Jesus, and Jesus said, No, you have nothing in me. And when he left, God made him powerful, came out under the authority of God, full of the Holy Ghost, and he went in among the people and started healing everybody that was sick and oppressed of the devil. See, you cannot sell out. You cannot cave in because Satan is going to tempt you to try to get you to do one thing. This is it. Stop living by faith. Because by faith is where the promises come, and by faith, here it is. That's where the reward comes. And if you don't live by faith, you won't get the eternal reward. Satan is after our inheritance, just like he was with Adam and just like he was with Esau. He's after our eternal inheritance in Christ. Stand your feet. For 2,000 years, people have wrestled with who he is. Embark on a journey with Pastor Asa Dockery in his new book, The Greatest Revelation, to find out more about the true identity of Jesus, order online now at whcnorth.org. When you sow into this ministry with a gift of $50 or more, Pastor Asa wants to give you his latest audio series entitled Discipleship 101, making disciples of all nations, and as a bonus, his latest book, The Greatest Revelation. Can't seem to find time to get into God's Word? Need an encouraging word at the right moment? Pastor Ace's daily devotions are available on our website at whcnorth.org. Use the Devotions tab and simply add your email address in the box provided or download the app for your smartphone. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 